my YouTube fam. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing great. I hope you're having a good week. I hope you're fired up for today's session. I'm fired up. I'm a little bit nervous because as we uh, know from our title today, uh, today is not my show. Today, uh, we are going to be joined by the one and only Jill Bogdanovich, and we are gonna try to fill our time with extracting every nugget of grading wisdom and insight that we can from her uh, over the next hour. So I am uh, really, really excited. And like I said, maybe just a hair nervous to be uh, sharing the stage with uh, one of my heroes. So I'm uh, very excited to bring Jill on uh, very shortly. And it looks like I've got her coming in uh, right now. So everyone hang tight for just a second. Let me get that set up. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring her on in just a moment's time, but let me, you know, just by way of a quick introduction and a way to frame our conversation today. You guys saw our topic today. I want to talk about the other part of film emulation that I think gets under discussed uh, in uh, our community, which is okay, you've got a good film emulation. You've got that in place. Now you actually have to grade the show. Now you have to grade the project and you have to make it look good. And that's not so easy. That takes an, an incredible amount of craft and skill to do. And that's really what I wanna ask Jill about because we tend to focus much more on like, oh, I want the secret sauce. I want the LUT, I want the emulation. Of course, that's important. You guys know how much I care about that, but what you do underneath that matters just as much. And in many cases, it matters more than the emulation that you are operating underneath. So that's kind of like the, theme that I want to focus on today. And the reason I wanted to ask Jill about this is uh, she is obviously got some of the biggest credits in our industry. She is the co-head of features at Company 3 and she, you know, look up her resume. I literally can't rattle off to you all the amazing films that she's graded. But the reason I wanted to get her on is because Jill's work all has a thumbprint of being consistently filmic. It has a really strong feeling to it. And it's also very sensitive to the creative intent and needs of her collaborators. And uh, I'll share this with you guys. My biggest beef with film emulation often is that it ends up becoming an excuse for making an image look less like what we want it to or less like what it should because we're like, oh, well, that's just what the emulation did. And Jill's work to me embodies the exact opposite of that, where it's all filmic. It all is borrowing from and participating in the filmic tradition but it is not blindly slapping on an emulation and saying, oh, it's good because it's an emulation or I'm done because it's an emulation. She's really getting in there and using that only as her starting point from which to craft a really compelling and beautiful image. So that's why I wanted to bring her out today. And I'm really excited to hear what she has to share with us. So I'm gonna bring her in right now. Hello, Jill. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. What's going <laughs> on in your world? I'm just coloring stuff. I'm actually in my uh, home office and I've been doing a lot of work from here. So it's been pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see you managed to get the, the big boy panels in there so you don't have to uh, oh, yeah. around through menus. Absolutely. I've got the big panels, I've got the X300, I've got my pivot, I've got all the fun toys in here. Oh my goodness. I love it. I love yeah. It. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We are, I can't tell you how excited and how many comments we've gotten this week. We're like, oh my gosh, Jill's coming. We're so excited. Oh, um, so thanks for being well, here. here. So where do we begin? I just gave uh, my intro to the group that I'll, I'll kind of uh, recap with you. Um, I, as you and I have talked about in kind of getting prepared for our conversation today, I think there tends to be a lot of emphasis when we're talking about whether a strict film, film emulation or a more general sort of filmic aesthetic that we might be going for in a grade, mm -hmm. there tends to be a lot of focus on that look and the pipeline and the LUT and that secret sauce. And obviously all that stuff matters. And I, I talk with my guys here on the channel quite a bit about those pieces. But what I really love about your work is that you always use that emulation as your starting point. And that's really where your creativity begins and where your craft and your mastery takes off from. So that's what I wanna talk about today is everything that happens after you've got that great emulation and what you do to bring things to life. So I guess maybe a, a great place to start would be if we think about maybe a more strict emulation uh, type of project, like like Joker, for example, where you were doing right. a pretty Pretty, pretty. You were, you were, you were aiming for a, a pretty strict em, em, emulation, if I understand that correctly, right? You're right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So in a project like that, you've got your lot, you've got your look built by uh, the, the one and only uh, Dr. Mitch Bogdanovich, your dad. Uh, so that's awesome. You've got a good look in place, but now you got to grade the show. So I'm wondering if you can tell me on a project like that, how do you approach that creative grading, those shot by shot decisions? What do you think about? What do you prioritize once you have that look in place? Absolutely. So that look gives us the film curve, basically. Uh, and that was, again, that was a really one-to-one, -one, very accurate, technically accurate film uh, emulation, which has a warmer highlight and more of a cyan shadow, right? And when I was talking with Larry Shear, the cinematographer, he really loves the filmic quality and all the different cyans and all the different subtleties in the um, in the blacks and the darker areas and in the highlights. He loves color separation. And um, it was very important when they were shooting in New York at night and they have all these different colors of lights. It was really, really important to be able to create and to maintain that kind of color separation that film would, you know? Yeah. And so he shot on the Airy uh, 65 and we did do a lot of testing for that, you know? So they shot some of the same, like the stairs, the famous stairs. Yeah. Uh, they shot on film and also on several different cameras. And really one of the things that uh, for, for a lot of clients, not just Larry, makes it feel very filmic is the color separation. So the LUT, yeah, I worked with my dad going back and forth. We found like, uh, you know, we had a very straight emulation, but then there's also a little bit of creativity in there that we had to, you know, take into consideration for, again, shooting at night, lots of different colored lights. We want to make sure we maintain as much detail as possible. That's always something I love to do when I'm grading as well, is something that for me makes an image really elegant are, are the subtleties, all the little details that I love to leave in there. Um, so even if we're doing something high contrast, which film tends to be, it's higher contrast in the midtones. It doesn't necessarily have to be high contrast in the whites and the blacks, right? That's where the S curve comes in is, right? So you've got a lower slope in the blacks and a lower slope in the highlights, but you've got all of this really nice contrast, which also gives you a natural color separation in the mids. So that all being said, we had the lookup table, which did all the things I wanted it to do, worked with my dad, it's so fun, but uh, then you have to color it, right? So of course, um, most people know that, that the lookup table is at the end of the chain. So it's an output let, right? And uh, I color before that. So what I always do when I'm coloring is, you know, we're still working on a digitally acquired image, which has so much range, right? And, and a nice contrast level that, that would give it that strength. But I did, as I was going through color grading, I went through and I did, first of all, I started with um, CDLs, our daily colorist is awesome. And, you know, worked with him and we went through and had a really nice CDL base grade, something that I was also involved in from the very beginning, right? Like I, I went out to New York and supervised dailies and helped get everything all together. So we're all on the same page, but so we had a nice CDL to start with, but going from there, I had, of course, had balance more shot to shot and also do either whether it be keys or power windows or certain control of, I, I had to keep under control things that I wanted to maintain that subtlety, right? So you got a bright fluorescent light in a kind of, you know, um, in like the psychiatric ward type of uh, environment and we really wanted to maintain uh, the, the, the greens and the cyans that you would see on film. Film is beautiful at picking up all those subtle tones. So something like that, there were keys, there were power windows to control that. So it didn't get too bright or it didn't get too washed out. And we were able to keep a lot of that same tone, the very subtle tone. So coloring before the what, right? Was still, you know, still like a normal, any, anytime you color with a film lot, or you color with any type of emulation, you still need to do a lot of uh, massaging and fine tuning before the LUT because the LUT gives you that, that nice container to work in, but there's still you know a lot more range since you're dealing with a digitally acquired image to be able to control and decide 
what part of that image do we really want to have shine? What do we, where do we want to direct the eye, right? So sometimes um, when I'm working on specifically like Joker, we did a lot of, we, as we call shaping. So, you know, Larry lit it amazing, right? But we also still will go through and make sure that you've got, you know, we want to make sure we bring the eye to where the audience should be looking, right? So I do that all the time. If you notice that we do it, then it's, we're not doing our job, but we do very subtly, maybe just take the highlights down in the window behind the character. And then that way it makes them separate and come forward, creating depth. That's I think where I'm getting to on that, right? So we create depth of color, we create depth with shaping, we create depth to be able to give the image a little bit of a life and a texture of its own. And that is very filmic. So everybody who says they love film, right? Everybody has a different way of describing it. It's so interesting, but you know, some people say that, oh, I love the contrast of films. Other people say, oh, I love the softness of film, <laughs> right? Yep. I think what they, I think what a lot of people are picking up on is the fact that you can have both. You've got contrast in the midtones, but you have beautiful soft tonality that shows up. So color grading for a lot like that, which is a higher contrast lot to be able to give you, you know, that, that tooth, that grip, that grit, you still need to control a lot of things. So it's kind of a long answer to, to get around to that, but yeah, they, that's kind of how I go about it. That, that's a long and great answer. And, and so many things uh, stick out to me about uh, what you just shared. But I think one of the things that I know I, I, I feel uh, is a consistent thing we can identify as filmic that we tend to be talking about when we say we love the film look is we love, as you mentioned, attention to detail. Like if we look at if I look at like To Catch a Thief or like any of my old, you know, favorite like VistaVision pictures, it's like there was absolute obsession about ratios and about like visual priority all the way through that sequence. And one of the things I admire uh, maybe more than anything about your work is when I look at something like Joker or any of your other films, I, I can't see what I know is happening, which is a seamless collaboration between you and the production team in terms of like, lighting and guiding the eye and shaping things. And uh, I, I'm sure in uh, a project like Joker, where you do have that high contrast ratio, it's not just your subject. It's like, all right, well, where do you want, like you said, where does that window need to sit? Where does that little object in the lower left that may not be first priority, but needs to be visible. I can, I can see without being able to pick a part that you are collaborating with the production team to sort of like dodge and burn and shape all that stuff inside of that big strong, uh, like you said, kind of middle uh, contrast slope, right? Exactly, it's exactly, yeah. That's that's how I think of it and that's exactly what we do, you know? And um, a lot of that stuff too happens, you know, one of the things happens as they're shooting as well. So one of the benefits of me being involved early with these guys is we build the LUT, do testing before everybody shoots and they have the LUT on the monitors, in the camera, whatever, on set. So everybody sees it and everybody can, so Larry can adjust his lighting, um, you know, oh, wait a minute, like the light is a little higher contrast. Maybe we need to like dim that light or whatever he decides to do. He can see it. Now, some things he chooses to let me do later based on time or whatever, sometimes, um, you know, or he can look at the color temperature of a light. Because one of the things that a traditional film light does, as you may know, is change primaries, <laughs> changes the color. So Joker has a very specific color scheme going. He's this red jacket and there's a lot of cyan. So there's blues and his green tie. So we did do a lot of testing to make sure that the LUT didn't um, change anything in a negative way. Um, but, you know, going through and, and, and having Larry see all of that as he's shooting, he can, he could adjust color temperature of lights or if, you know, something felt too, whatever, too distracting, he could adjust it on set. And then just communicate to me later, like, hey, you know, in this scene, whatever, I left that wall or I left that light or, you know, we, we would deal with it later. But, you know, that collaboration makes it much smoother and it makes the vision of the whole look of the film be much more, um, it's just a good communication tool. It's much more put together with the director and the editors and the cinematographer and the producers. Everybody can see it. Uh, in the dailies and see the general idea 
early on so it doesn't become a point of contention when we finally get to the DI. And that's a huge, huge plus that I do that with all of my shows now, if I can. I mean, that that's a, a game changer right there. Like I, when I, I try is I, I try to make a habit of like to put myself in the shoes of the production team and in particular, like the you know production designer and cinematographer. And I think about the really good summary that you just made of like, here's just a couple of the, you know, like really uh, significant things that a good film emulation is going to do. It's going to, you know, skew your white point. It's going to change the primaries around. Like it's not doing small things. It's really re-sculpting your image. And I try to imagine being a cinematographer and doing something that happens all the time on uh, smaller shows or shows with less involved colorists were like, I'm shooting under like my K1S1 and now the colorist is going to give me a film emulation. Like that, that uh, great example of like, okay, where is that piece of wardrobe hitting through that film system? Like try to imagine hitting the bullseye without having a target to aim at, you know? Like, exactly, exactly. And, and it, be, it can be quite a shock. You know, if somebody says, I want it to look filmic, but then put on you know, a filmic or a true film lot, it really sometimes might be too strong from what they have been seeing to where you're going. So that's where the psychology comes in, right? Is just getting it right or getting it as close as possible from the very beginning. And then everybody, no matter how you want to describe <laughs> what film looks like, everybody's looking at it. And, and so, <laughs> so everybody can make comments and, and get used to it. And that way too, they never saw it under a K1S1. So they have really nothing else to compare. It, it just, it is, it lives in that world from the very beginning. And so, yeah. And if, if somebody's shooting say under a K1S1 and then you go to a film lot, it's a pretty drastic change if you really split screen it. So it can be, it can be definitely, you know, even they say they want a really strong look, it's psychologically, even if you show it to them, it might end up somewhere in the middle only because it's almost too far away from what they're used to seeing. It's so tough to recalibrate your, your it's tough for us as colorists who do this every day to recalibrate our eyes. Like I can't imagine right. living with an image that you're like, that's my image for weeks or months. And then being like, oh, wait, it turns out my image is completely different. That's a lot to ask. Yeah, exactly. And then on another note too, visual effects, that's a whole other thing, right? So visual effects build something under a K1S1, assuming that's what it's gonna look like and they have everything perfectly balanced and then you throw that under a film LUT, it can really break visual effects very quickly. Yes, and I'm, I'm curious, this would probably be more a question for uh, Larry than for you, but I'm, I'm wondering if you know, does he, like on Joker, is he lighting more by meter or by monitor or some combo thereof? It could be a combo. I actually, it's more of a question for Larry. I know he looks yeah. at the monitors a lot, um, but he also used to shoot a lot of films. So, you know, he's got a really good eye for, yeah, for he's, me. He's used to measuring those, those ratios, which is obviously the other huge thing that changes, like the ratio of like a stock camera LUT versus, uh, you know, like that beautiful LUT that you built with your dad. That, that ratio is like, I, I mean, I don't know mathematically, like double, like it's, it's way more in terms of key. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I don't know mathematically what it is either, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> a lot. I know what it feels like, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely more. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I've got uh, Rafa here is uh, with us. Who's watching the chat and seeing what questions folks have out there. Rafa, we have anything juicy coming from uh, the thread yet? Love it. Yeah. We have a question from three movie production. How much of the look is done by you? And how important is your color science team in a production like Joker? Good question. It's pretty important. So, you know, as we were um, kind of discussing a little bit earlier, the LUT is, it gives you a good, um, a palette in a way. So, you know, say if you're doing a painting, you've got all your colors laid out on that palette. How do you put them together? That's kind of how I think about it. So you're giving, I now have this beautiful palette of colors of tone going from black to white or whatever white point really is that we're dealing with and whatever black point we're dealing with. Cause really Joker has no black and no real white in the whole movie. It's got more of a cyan black, it gets pretty deep, but, and it's got, um, you know, some brighter areas but they are a little bit warmer. So I've got this beautiful palette almost in limited colors because it doesn't make colors outside of what film would make, right? So it doesn't make certain neon colors very well and that type of thing, but it's not supposed to because film never did either. And um, so you've got this beautiful palette and then it's how you take those paints and how you mix them and how you actually 
uh, again, guide the eye to where you want the audience to look and, and do it as you're saying seamlessly. Like I always say, if you can see where, if you can see my fingerprint on where I've been putting power windows or keys, then I'm not doing a good job. You know, and I should, you should be able to blow up on a 90 foot screen and still not see it. So to answer that question is basically, you know, how much is me and how much is the, is the color science team? First of all, my color science team is very important, not only for creating the look, right? creating that one show LUT, because every show has one LUT in my uh, preference, and um, workflow wise, that works the best. But they also are super important for doing, as I call them, sister LUTs, to be able to create different color spaces. So say I'm grading in P3D65 for my primary grade for theatrical, and then I also will need the say an HDR for, for Dolby Vision and uh, EDR, Extended Dynamic Range for, for Dolby, they'll make me a love for that, or for HDR on glass for 1,000 nits or 4,000 nits or wherever nits, or new nits that we're gonna be dealing with, um, <laughs> you know, or 709. All of those LUTs are all sister LUTs based off of my um, one, basically show LUT. So my color science team also uh, keeps me in check so that I make LUTs all the time for each show. And so when I create a LUT, I send it to my color science team to basically vet it to make sure that it's not doing anything that will be destructive for visual effects or to make sure the curve is, is clean um, or, or not, depending on what I want that LUT to do. So I work very closely with, with color science. They're super important. Very cool. All right, I'm going to keep all of you guys in the chat uh, in suspense. I see all those questions stacking up, but I've, I've got uh, another one that, that came up uh, for me that I wanted to ask Jill about. So let's move off of, uh, we've, we've talked about strict emulation with Joker and, and uh, gotten some really good insights there. I want to talk about some of your other work. Like let's use, let's use the last couple of Spider-Man movies as uh, an example. Those are films that do something that I find uh, just as interesting as like, wow, look at Joker. Like that really feels like I'm looking at something that was shot and, uh, you know, like run through the system that it would have been if this happened, you know, when those stocks were uh, in use. Like that's so cool. When I look at a lot of your other work, I think it would be probably difficult to say that you're doing a strict emulation uh, with a lot of your other shows, but there is an unquestionable filmic palette in play there. So how does that work? And like, how do you do that? With like, or, or how do you think about that? Uh, if, if that makes sense, it's kind of an open-ended question. Yeah, no, that's actually a good question because, um, you know, I love Marvel. I love working with Marvel, but they are massive visual effects shows. And, um, they will traditionally use a very clean LUT, not a film emulation necessarily, more of a technical one to go with whatever camera they're shooting. So maybe not necessarily K1S1 because they do have a, quite a variety of, uh, of looks if you really look at their films, right? So it's not all one specific thing, but what they do have in common is a very technical, clean um, starting point so that the visual effects can be super accurate clean, all that type of thing. And also since they are working on those shows for a very long period of time, they do get very, very um, accustomed to how it should look, you know, with, and those are all decisions that are consciously being made throughout that process. So my job is in that, in that realm is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit different because I'm supporting the visual effects. I'm supporting the look that they're, they're using. Of course, I still come in and, and create the flow to the movie and also, you know, maybe things that they weren't going to be doing in visual effects, I take over, you know, there's, it changes all the time, right? Always there to, to figure it out. But I personally always like to limit colors in, in a palette that feels unnatural or unfilm, not very filmic. So certain colors that are too neon or or too electric or um, distracting in a way that make an image feel not as elegant, then I definitely tend to try to control those. And I also really love in those shows and, and specifically like Spider-Man, keeping a lot of it, that detail is so cool, right? Like even yeah. in this most recent Spider-Man, all the explosions and skies, and they had so many beautiful shots in that movie. I wanted to maintain 
oh, those subtle tones. So I still do the same kind of thing that I did on Joker. It's just, I can't help myself, you know, to try to bring in all the different color tones and to be able to, as Larry Shearer calls it, I think he's, he, he uh, has this great term. He calls it rounded color. And if you wow. kind of think of it right in that way, it's like, it, it's almost like an expanded color palette where you see, you know, say, a person in front of a dark background, a rounded color would all of a sudden bring in all this, the subtle tonalities that you see in skin tone and maybe like the blues and the purples and the greens that all kind of would be floating around in black, just like you see in a traditional painting. A lot of times in traditional, say, even Renaissance paintings, there there's no black. If you really look closely, it's all different deep colors mixed together, right? So it's very similar to that. Very cool. Everyone just take take really close note of uh, at least what I understood from uh, what Jill just shared. A big part of what she's describing about the workflow, uh, like on th these Marvel pictures, for example, we've talked about this so much on the channel. It's not just what you do. It's what you don't do. It's the colors you don't allow through. It's the colors that you do tame in as much as like what I thought color was when I first began grading of like, oh, wh where's the 11 knob? And let's turn everything to that level like yep. even like the red of the spider suit i think is a great example you've got mm -hmm. that slotted into a really it doesn't feel manipulated but that's not the that's probably not the red that the sensor saw that's that's been somewhat sculpted by the system you built for it right right and and it's something that we have to keep very consistent of course that's something that's very important is is the color of the spider-man red in in all different lighting in all different areas you know to always make sure it feels the same of course, it changes slightly in dark light, warm light, cool light, that kind of thing, but always making it feel the same. Um, so it's, it's you know, you, we don't want to have his, his suit bouncing around. And then, you know, all the different visual effects and all the different quick cuts and that type of thing. It's really important, again, in, in to be able to smooth all that out, to all make it feel like one, to make it all feel seamless so that you don't feel bumping of the cuts and that kind of thing. So that's a huge part of it as well. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, all right, Rafa, what else we got out there? Let's, let's get some uh, other, other questions for Jill other than, uh, I'm, I'll try not to hog the whole hour here. It's, not easy. <laughs> it's hard not to do so. Jose Maria Abreu Santos has a question for Jill. Did you at any point feel like you were working against the lat? Did the film emulation that you used felt restrictive at any point? That's a very good question. Um, to me, my answer would say, I don't think it was restrictive for me. I felt like, you know, I really leaned into it specifically on, on Joker. Um, there were certain bright lights that were going direct, say when Joker was on stage during like a, a comedy, his comedy routine, when he was on stage, there were some bright lights coming directly at camera. And I had to kind of work a little harder to kind of make sure that those were elegant um, because the film let definitely would make it go up a little higher than normal. Like if a K1S1 was, was in line, but, um, no, I didn't feel like I was working against it. I always, when I'm creating, when I work on any kind of LUT, I always test it out in all different types of situations to make sure it feels correctly, to make sure that it, it's doing some, it's always doing what I want it to do in a way that is not restrictive. So I just kind of test that out early on before I actually give a let out to somebody to use. More uh, nuggets to take home guys, no substitution for uh, attention to detail and testing and revising stuff. It sounds like that's key to not running into that, that uh, very well described scenario of like, oh wait, that's doing something I don't like and now I'm stuck with it. Totally. So when I'm building a lot, I never build a lot on one scene or one shot. I will build a lot and I will bounce around to make sure it works on dark scenes, light scenes, bright scenes, overexposed or fluorescent or any kind of thing. I make sure that it works well under all conditions. Very cool. Rafa, what else we got out there? Well, let's go to grading. We have a question from Kevin Oberhausen or collaborator. I often have a challenging time retaining details in the shadow without losing a pleasing weight in the bottom of the image. Any tips, processes, or ways of thinking you'd recommend to solve this? Well, that's interesting. Um, I've, I've, I've been asked that a lot because I do, when I color, I always like stretching out, I call it stretching out the black between the black and the gamma so that I can 
create a deep black, but still maintain detail. Again, the LUT helps with that too. But if you're, if you're coloring, you want nice color, nice contrast and low end. I, I always, I find that you can really do a lot just with balancing lift gamma and gain. Um, I always will, you know, play around depending on the image you can, uh, you know, play with the balance. So say you've got the blacks are pretty low. You can bring up the gamma and bring down the gain. Just finding that balance with those three controls. You have a lot of control there that, um, some people kind of don't play with that as much as they should. And we'll go to curves first or start trying to key first. My, my biggest, um, piece of advice when people ask me things like that is get a solid image using just lift gamma again, keep it as simple as you can from the very beginning. And I always kind of like to go back to thinking about Japanese painting, how, you know, they take this many, many years to perfect having a brush and making one single very articulate line. It looks very easy, but it takes many, many years of practice. So it's very similar in that way with just using lift gamma and gain to be able to balance an image, to be able to get that deep contrast in the black and open up a little bit of um, detail going up into the gamma. What a beautiful metaphor, that, that single well-placed effortless line that takes so many repetitions to get right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and you know, guys, I, I, I can't help but emphasize as I hear Jill talking about this right now, if we just look at like the history of uh, the uh, company that Jill works for and where they came from, the, the big way that Company 3 made its name when they uh, became, uh, you know, like when they, when they started grading pictures, they were using the same lift gamma and gain that all the other post facilities at the time were using, all the same tools. It's just that there was much more emphasis on how can we make this look filmic as opposed to how can we color correct this. That's really like the legacy of the shop. And I feel like still uh, what you guys do so well today is like, it's, you, you don't have like, you know, company three software 10.0. I know you have all kinds of proprietary elements, but th there may be less than what we all think of secret sauce and more about like just harnessing the tools in a different way and with more attention to detail, like Jill is saying. Am I getting that right? Do you think, Jill? Absolutely. I, I really do. These are all my, um, my friends that I work with, right? All these amazing colorists. We all do think in that way, a lot of us anyway, I mean, there's, there's quite a big <laughs> diverse group, but um, really a lot of people think make it as simple as possible, you know? And because there, there's a lot of experience, most of us, I don't think there's anybody who's been doing it less than 20 years uh, at Company 3. Everybody, we've all been doing this for a long time. And it just, it does come with experience, like figuring out once it kind of clicks in, you kind of figure out how to manipulate just the very simple tools. It, it can really do a lot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, get, getting the, the, the details of the basics, right. Is a, a very powerful thing. It is. Yeah. Rafa, what else we got out there? We have a question from Matthew Wagoner, something like that. What tools do you use to accentuate texture without looking over processed? And I want to add, what's your process of mind when talking about texture? Cool. So texture, usually when people say texture, they mean grain, right? Um, so go back to Joker. For Joker, what we ended up using is live grain. So live grain is a separate program. And what it does is it looks at the red, green, blue channel, separates it out and creates a different type of, uh, basically it's actually scanned film uh, and you can choose whatever stock you want. We actually went with the stock that matched our LUT. And um, so that will create grain texture or depth. So say you've got a person in front of a dark wall, that person, the reds in their skin or different whatever colors, the warmer tones in their skin will have less grain than the cooler or darker background. So that creates a textural depth, okay? So that is one of the things that we also used on Joker to make it feel more filmic. Now, um, I also use the Sapphire plugins often to be able to create texture grain. Um, I you know, I really love that too. Sometimes I'll add a couple different layers because really technically, if you look at, at film on film prints from back in the day, print stock is, it, or when you'd see a print in the, in the theater, it's a combination of two grain structures. It's the negative grain structure 
and how it interacts with the print stock grain structure. Um, and of course, then there's view of the uh, projector and stuff too, which changes things as well, and lenses. There's lots of variables, but when, when I wanna create texture for something, um, if it has to be very filmic, live grain is amazing. And then using sometimes two layers of sapphire. So say maybe a really fine layer of sapphire grain to make it feel like negative, And then a little heavier or larger grain uh, with a little bit more contrast to it for a print stock. And sometimes you find different ways to combine that to be able to find really beautiful texture. So much cool stuff in there, excuse me. Um, yeah. I hope uh, you guys and Jill don't mind me continuing to kind of editorialize as we go along because Jill is throwing so much at us that there are, are little nuggets that I wanna make sure we grab as they go by. One of the things that's occurring to me that uh, I want us all to take note of as Jill is talking, whether we're talking about a plugin or a film emulation LUT or a LUT being built for maybe not a strict emulation project, I want you guys to notice the mastery and the ownership that Jill has over the entire journey from sensor to screen here. So this is not about, well, I do my thing and then I have this magic other element that I slot in and I just trust it blindly and I don't really know what it's doing, but it seems to make good images most of the time. So I'm just going to kind of roll with it and uh, grade through it or grade underneath it. I think that's one of the problematic things that uh, comes up with film emulation a lot is we kind of hand over a big chunk of our pipeline to something that is no longer in the realm of our control. So I just yeah. want us all to take notice of however, uh, whatever the project is that Jill is working on, whatever tools, plugins, LUTs she's using, these are things that she's taken the time to really understand on a granular level and to collaborate with the people who may be helping to implement those things so that she really owns and understands uh, the, the entire pipeline. Do you feel like that's an important part of your process, Jill? Huge, important, huge. I always need to know when I'm using any of my tools and I always, you know, anybody who I'm mentoring or talking to about this, always say, learn the tools as much as you can. Learn how they work. Learn why they work. Um, go through training, ask 10 million questions. I still am learning about all the different things. There's always things that are changing and learning. I'm um, changing that I have to learn about, which is part of the fun stuff. But uh, you, I, I very, I, I'm the type of colorist that I don't like to use something if I don't know what it's doing or if I can't test it, you know, thoroughly. And uh, so definitely like uh, speaking of live brain, I went through all the training on live brain. So I understood how they use it what type of compression, how do they do that? Like, where does it come from? You know, all that kind of thing. Sonny, who owns the company and kind of created it, he'll go through all of that. He loves teaching about that stuff. So, <laughs> you know, the, when you start asking questions and learning about these tools, or even on, you know, going through all the Sapphire plugins, I have uh, direct access to some really amazing colorists that I work with at Company 3, like Siggy, he's so technical. And I could always just text him and ask him stuff like, what about this? How does this work? You know, what bit depth does this, da, 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 and he'll, you know, knows all the things. So, um, you know, I always say, ask all the questions you possibly can, learn about the tools. And if you don't have necessarily access to that, do testing on your own, to figure out what it's actually doing. Uh, I used to take um, uh, different, basically had these, charts that had all different colors on them. And I used to run them through different lookup tables and, and actually, well, my dad taught me a lot of this stuff to be able to read them and see and plot them and see what's happening. So I used to basically deconstruct LUTs and understand where they break, what's the plot, what, what's the plot of the actual curve and, and all that kind of stuff. So if you have access to that kind of thing, do that, um, you know, just try to break it apart in your own way so you understand it. And then that'll help you solve problems later on. One of the reasons that I uh, tend to do so many visual effects movies, and I really love working on visual effects movies is because I also understand the visual effects process. I can also understand and speak their language a little bit more about how they break things apart. And, and um, you know, when they give me all the different mats or layers, how they put them together and how they've balanced it under the lookup table and CDL and you know, what they're doing in the background, all that kind of thing is really nice to know, understand when I'm starting to work on it because I can either prevent problems or solve problems so it just goes smoother just because of all the knowledge that I have about the process. Very cool. Yeah. Um, Rafa, what else we got out there? I we, I'm, I'm going to keep kicking to you for a while because we're, we're stacking up here in the chat. 
Yeah, we have a very good question here from Rafael, from me. Rafael. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How much should we younger colorists care about film emulation in the future? What is your take on how the color grading world will evolve in the future in terms of preferences? What film characteristics do you think will preserve and which ones will get deprecated? That's really interesting. Well, it's funny because nobody really wants to let go of film. Everybody seems to really still love film because it's got that beautiful, organic, almost real, well, perceived real or cultural real um, look to it. And when I say cultural because people, probably most of our, I don't know, like people in their 30s and 40s grew up watching images shot on film and going to movie theaters being projected with film projectors, right? That is a cultural feel to an image. Now, a lot of the younger kids, like my children, <laughs> they go to the theater and they see things digitally projected and a lot of things that are more, um, a little cleaner look and that don't, doesn't have the jitter or the shake or that kind of, or dirt on the screen or anything like that. So they are growing up culturally to accept different images or to be used to or remember or remember that feel, um, even if they can't put their fingers on it, remember the feel of that image. So it's gonna be interesting actually to see how images evolve because there's always an, an evolving um, look or a cultural during the time period where we're in, you know, so you, you look back 15 years ago and bleach pie past high contrast, low saturation was like the thing. And now I feel like at this time we're going for more color depth, a little richer images, uh, you know, very um, painterly type of images that I think are becoming more the norm now. But what is going to happen in the future? I don't really think that the film idea is gonna really go away because simply for the fact that film is, oh, is, is thought to be almost a um, high, high quality, beautiful image. So no matter how anybody thinks about or how they describe what film is, people see a film image and will feel like it's a high quality art type of image. So because that is the kind of psychology behind film, I don't think that idea will go away. I think that there's always going to be an evolving kind of look for movies, TVs, music videos, all that stuff kind of tends to flow together, interestingly enough, if you look back at, in history. So I think in the future, things like, you know, Joker or, you know, any other like really strong looks to different, there's a lot of so many beautiful movies, you know, like Cherry was really beautiful and um, 10 million of them, there's so many. And like the Oscar nominated movies this year are incredible. So there's, I mean, they're amazing. So some of these, these movies are going to become, you know, iconic or already are. And a lot of them do still have that filmic high quality, almost art piece. Like if you took those images and you hung them in a gallery, they would be a beautiful show. So that I think is still gonna always be the goal for images for movies, no matter what it's acquired on. You, you, you've shaken something loose in my head today or, or like clarified an idea that it, it seems like filmic in the sense that the word is evolving uh, today, it's almost just like it's becoming shorthand for the level of attention to detail that we're talking about. Yes. Like, no, you just care more, you spend more time, you fuss more over details than the average show. Exactly, which I think it's interesting. Like that is, I've picked that up over the years. You know, I used to color everything on. I mean, I still was digitally coloring. I wasn't film timing, but coloring things that were acquired on film. And that's always what people would talk about is the detail and, and the tonality and things. So that is, I think it's become a definition for that high quality, high attention to detail beautiful tonality, separation, uh, you know, and sometimes texture, like the, mm. the grain. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty interesting. And I think it's a, a fun place that, uh, if I can uh, interject my humble ideas here, like a fun place to look for the future is like, 
we look at animated films right now, there's so many animated films that are like, wow, that there are colors in there that will not, w- would not like be allowed through any film system ever, but they're still being created with the attention to detail that we're talking about and with the color science, uh, you know, like rigor that we're talking about. So they feel good. Absolutely. And so that's actually a really great point. Um, I, I was going to get to this too, actually you reminded me, HDR, right? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's showing us, all right, I've got, it shows you so many more colors and, you know, it's uh, basically it's just a new paint box, right? And so now moving forward, just like you said, like, you know, watching something like Frozen in HDR, there's different purples and blues and things that would never be allowed on film, but are so cool and so beautiful and lend themselves to the story. And so in the future as well, I think, you know, say like my kids who love Frozen, right? You know, when they get older, are they gonna think film looks, you know, kind of muted and dirty or whatever? Possibly, you know, where you've got like these like really bright poppy high color color separation, type movies that they're growing up with now with in HDR like you know we uh, my tv at home we've got a nice HDR Dolby Vision whatever my kids are just used to it you know and if I show them back and forth like in here and um, I'll show them I'll flip be just hanging with my kids and flip from HDR to SDR and my 13 year old would be like why does that why does it look so dull I'm like yeah, yeah. <laughs> right so yeah, the, 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 yeah sorry go ahead you, no, I was just going to say that you know, it's going to be very interesting culturally where it goes, because I think the idea of film is going to evolve to just like the most beautiful, high dynamic range, high quality attention to detail, whether or not it looks exactly like film, I think will be irrelevant. So well put. And again, I'll, I'll emphasize what sticks out to me about Jill's insights here, guys, that you can only say, oh, well, wouldn't it be kind of interesting to let that purple through that wouldn't come through the film system? You have to understand that that wouldn't come through the film system and you have to have the taste and the bearing to say, well, just because it wouldn't go through an emulation doesn't mean I don't want it. Or conversely to say, hey, there's a good reason that that was that, that uh, really isn't in a traditional palette and I don't want to let it in even now. Making those kind of decisions, that's a lot harder than saying, oh, look at this beautiful lot that you know like i found uh, you know under uh, the couch cushions or whatever like you need you need that taste and that bearing and that confidence to help arbitrate what makes a good image and what doesn't and to move the uh, the the like cultural aesthetic forward or at least stay uh, on trend with that i think exactly i always like to make this parallel as well it's the same thing as if you're decorating in a house right you can put in all these really beautiful pieces of furniture in there but you got to figure out what goes together right? What, what things work well together? You know, you can paint a wall blue and have all these different things, but you can have almost too much and it doesn't work. It falls apart. And it's the same thing for a movie. Like you, you need to curate your colors and really choose and feel what works for the palette. Very cool. Uh, Rafa, what else we got? Let's, I, I, we're we're going we're gonna to take every minute we can from you if you're uh, cool with that, Jill. We'll I'm cool. You. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Maybe a short one from William Aleman. Are your lads today created for HDR workflow? Uh, you said SDR workflow? HDR, HDR. Oh, HDR. Yeah. So um, some of the Netflix shows or whatever shows that I'm doing, I will start coloring in HDR. So I do have those in my primary lot for the show is HDR especially if the cinematographer has HDR viewing on set, which is becoming more and more um, common. So my master LUT can be HDR. Uh, We pick whatever knit level based on what monitors they're viewing and that kind of thing. But so HDR can be, excuse me, the, um, the main LUT. And then we have my wonderful color science team that can create the SDR uh, flavor if we want, or if it's Dolby Vision, then I just use a CMU to do the little conversion down to 100 nits if I have to, or sometimes I'll do a standalone um, SDR through a 709, a 709 sister lot, depending on the workflow. But yeah, I'll, I'll do a lot of stuff in HDR. Very cool. What else, Rafa? Okay, let's stick with the lat topic from Aurora Films. Do you grade? Uh, do you usually grade an entire project under a single film LUT output, or do you find you need to use different variation of that LUT based on the scene 
for example, a night scene versus a brighter, uh, whatever. That's a good question. I get asked that all the time, especially by cinematographers. So um, a lot of time, I prefer one LUT per show. Reason being, it keeps the most consistent. It is easy for, much easier and much more uh, simple for visual effects. And I uh, believe that a lot of, well, I know that the LUTs that I make will hold up in dark scenes, light scenes, whatever. I make sure that that's the case, that they're technically strong LUTs. And I'm a big believer that you can do a lot in the CDO as well. So if say, you know, I'm working on a TV show where they have flashbacks, it has like a bleach bypass look. Sometimes, a lot of times I'll let them use the same master LUT and I'll create CDLs for them to start with that I twisted around using with Gambling Gang and created a look that, um, that they can use as a flashback that is different enough. So I'd say 99% of the time I'll stick with one LUT. Now there are certain times where there is a different LUT that might need to happen. So say if you've got black and white and you're just retaining red or something like that, um, you can't do that in CDL. And uh, then that would require a different LUT just for that scene. But as far as using a different LUT for different types of lighting conditions, no, I don't do that. I make sure that the LUT is solid enough so that it will, it'll hold up. Awesome. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the power of a good LUT, right? It should be able to <laughs> absorb a variety of uh, scene conditions. Exactly. Very cool. What else, Rafa? From James Segars. For those of us hoping to go pro colorist full time at a prestigious company like Company Three, what types of certification or training would you recommend pursuing? That's cool. Um, well, everybody has a different background. Um, I studied photography and art, and so that's and of course worked at Kodak as an intern for a while. So I learned all the equipment and also have an art background. So everybody has a different way of coming up into the business. I always recommend studying art and photography. Um, that never hurts, especially because all of our clients are very well versed in art and photography. Um, and then a lot of times people start at say company three as either an assist or something like that. So learning extremely well the technical uh, inner workings of Resolve so you can color trace, build EDLs, do all of the really important, very important um, kind of housekeeping work of, of keeping a project together. And sometimes it can get very complicated with some of the bigger shows. Understanding all of that is a very, very good way to, to be able to get into a bigger company because a lot of times you will be an assist first before you will get any opportunities to actually uh, color. Makes good sense. Good advice. Uh, Rafa, let's take one more from the group and then I've, I've got uh, one more in my back pocket for Jill. Okay. I have this question and I cannot resist not to ask. Are shows getting too dark or do most people have bad TVs? <laughs> well, that's a good question, I guess. Um, it's funny because, you know, now the TVs are coming out and I think their standard calibration tends to be better, uh, to be honest. And there's also filmmaker mode, which is in built into a lot of TVs. So the TV is now becoming smarter and smarter to be able to calibrate quicker so that you don't have to deal with it. And then Dolby Vision, the same thing. My, my TV at home will flip back and forth to Dolby and SDR, and it just kind of reads the metadata and puts it in what it's supposed to do. Now, um, a lot of people aren't aware <laughs> that user TVs, you know, how, what a huge difference going in sports mode or standard versus cinema mode. They have no idea really what that's doing, nor do they really care um, on a lot of, a lot of times. And um, I think some of the, in response to our shows getting too dark, I think it's all about the story, right? So if a show comes out and um, the story is dark and it's at night and the filmmaker wants to have the audience feel that tension or feel that kind of almost repressed uh, dark feeling to be able to go along with the story. I think that it, it all comes down to the story because there's a lot of shows that are not like dark. Um, being lit, it's interesting because if you look at traditionally how TV shows were lit a long time ago when they were shot on film, say maybe, I don't know, 60s or 50s and that kind of thing then 
those things were much, were lit differently. We're lit more open. We're not as painterly with the dodging and burning on set. So I think the aesthetic of, uh, of what, first of all, the digital cameras can capture and then also kind of what people accept and, and want to look at for an image, right, is, is evolving. So, uh, you know, people say, oh, I don't want my show to look like a sitcom. What does a sitcom look like? Well, that's over, over too bright without a lot of shaping, right? So there is a lot of shaping in a lot of shows now, which sometimes can make it feel darker. And yes, I think a lot of people don't understand how to, or don't want to know, or don't understand how to calibrate TVs or or even realize what a big difference it makes in what they see. So there's, there's, I think though, what I've noticed is a lot of people are becoming more educated on that, especially in LA, all my friends. I mean, I can't help myself. I'll help teach them. <laughs> they go to their house and see it's in sports mode. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That. That. That's. A, 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 I feel like every good colorist I've ever met is kind of a natural, like, sharer and teacher. It's like, hey, here's why that matters. Here's why you probably shouldn't do sports mode when you watch The Godfather or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> well, great. Great questions, guys. I, I've got uh, one final one for you, Jill, and it's kind of an impossible question. Cool. I love this. I want to go back to our original topic of like grading underneath a film emulation lot. And I want to ask you for the cheat sheet. I want to ask you for the shorthand. If you could give me like the one most important, like hands-on uh, advice that uh, I could use of like, all right, I'm about to grade under my first emulation and I got to make it work and I want to get the best results possible. Does anything come to mind, like something you would really focus on or emphasize or something you would worry less about uh, in that kind of scenario? Well, um, Coloring under a real film LUT feels different than coloring under a K1S1 LUT. So I would say get used to how that reacts because certain controls move quicker than you expect or slower than you expect. So kind of get used to that. Um, as far as, you know, one of the things I always tell, I would definitely tell anybody starting to work under um, film LUTs is control the detail as much as you can. Um, pay attention to those little details because all those little details come together and it creates that feel. Um, so making sure lamps don't clip or, or get too bright or making sure that windows, you still feel a hint of color there, not just letting them go white. Those types of things that and attention to detail, specifically under a film that might have a little bit more crunch to it. Those are definitely things I, I think are super important to, to pay attention to. I can't think of a better place to, to end and, and uh, that really rounds out what I think has been the theme of today of like, hey, we may think that the magic is all in, oh, look at that great film emulation that that was graded under, which is of course a huge part of it. But what we are talking about today that Jill brings to the table and uh, if she's doing her job well, like she does, she does so seamlessly without our being able to spot it is that attention to detail and making sure that within that steep slope of the middle of the curve and all the other unique properties of a uh, rigorous film emulation that we're getting the best possible image that we can and prioritizing what's important creatively to uh, the filmmakers. Uh, so I, I think that's a perfect way to round things out. And I'm gonna take that advice into my grading today. Pay more attention to the little things and really nuance underneath. Maybe you've got the best look in the world, but you know, uh, make it sync underneath there, right? Exactly. I always do that. Like, so I'll go through and create a look and I circle back several times and find ways to make it better, how to make it richer, how to make it have more complexity. Fantastic. Well, Jill, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us who are here today for being so generous with your time and your knowledge and your insights. And uh, we hope to have you join us again sometime. Anytime. Thank you so much for having me. I had a lot of fun. Thank you very much. We'll speak, speak soon, I'm sure. Absolutely. All right. You Bye -bye. take care. Take care. All right, guys. Well, I hope y'all enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, that was so cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a little speechless right now because I've, uh, that was just so much knowledge condensed into the last hour. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Let me know if you did. Uh, and if you wanna see uh, more guests like Jill join us for the show. Uh, a couple quick announcements before we wrap up for today. Uh, first of all, my show LUT course is starting on Monday. So if you want to learn how to build show LUTs like we were talking about today, that's a great place to get started. I can't promise that in the 
short two week period that we're together, you're going to be able to build uh, the Joker Sholut in all of its beauty and complexity, but you will have a much better grasp of what LUTs are, what they aren't, how they work, and how you can build them for usage in your grading as well as for your collaborators to uh, furnish to them on set so that they can have that viewing context that we talked about today. So important if you really want to get great filmic images that you give your collaborators the opportunity to see what that rendering is going to be as opposed to a stock camera rendering. So uh, we'll leave a link to that in the description. Definitely go check it out. It's always a really fun two week period uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a really good time. Uh, so second, I want to feature your work here on the channel. So we're going to be sending out an email soon asking for you guys to submit your looks and your stills uh, using the, the uh, Elements LUT pack that is available on colinkellycolor.com. So be on the lookout for that. I really wanna see what you guys are doing with the Elements LUT pack. Uh, and we're gonna include those as an example in an upcoming uh, training that we're gonna be releasing. And I'll be selecting some stills and looks to review here on the channel. So just as a heads up, we are gonna be using those things and uh, broadcasting them out. So if you share them and they're good, be ready for us to uh, put you on blast and show them off. Uh, but I really wanna see what you guys are doing with these LUTs and find out if you're enjoying them. If you haven't uh, checked them out, definitely encourage you to go do so uh, on colinkellycolor.com. Again, links are all in the description. Uh, and we've also got our freebies that have been out for a little bit now, but if you missed it, we've got uh, the middle uh, exposure, um, uh, or yeah, the mid-grade cheat sheet rather. We've got our exposure chart, my free Kodak 2383 print film emulation LUT. Bunch of different freebies that you can get individually or you can get them in the starter pack, which again is linked in the description. So uh, some fun stuff for you guys to check out. Thanks to all of you guys for joining me today. Thanks for your awesome questions. And I really hope you guys uh, enjoyed that half as much as I did. Have an awesome weekend and we will see you uh, for the next installment of Grade School. Take care guys.